Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to church. Glad that you're here. If I haven't met you before, my name is Grant. Let me introduce two incredible people to you. First of all, this is my wife, Laurel, and I'm so glad that Laurel's here on stage with me. And this is Jared Bowman, and Jared is going to kind of moderate and host our time together. So every Wednesday afternoon at 4 o'clock Pacific Standard Time, Jared and I jump on a live YouTube show, and we do something that we call Ask Pastor Grant. It's a Jesus.net platform. People text in questions from all around the world. It's a live chat that's running, and I do my best to try and answer them. And then once a month, Laurel comes and joins us in the podcast, and she gives her unique um, and passionate perspective on the questions that come in as well. So every once in a while... We decide to throw caution to the wind, and instead of doing a monologue, like a sermon where I preach at you, we actually have a conversation. So you can send a question right now live to 360, there it is, 335-2800. We're going to do our best to get to as many of these as possible. Here's what's a little crazy. We don't know what the questions are ahead of time. So we don't have time to prep. So we're flying without a net and doing the best we can, which means we're going to try really hard. We're going to trust the Holy Spirit, and you're going to be really kind and gracious. <laughs> that's kind of how that's going to work together, all right? So we're so glad that everyone is here. But what we're going to do to start today is something we did in the Revelation series, which is we're actually going to pause. We're going to take a moment. We're going to say, Holy Spirit, come and just fill this place with your presence. And let our words be your words. So let's just take a moment and then we'll pray together and then we'll get started. Okay. Holy Spirit, come and calm our minds, our hearts, our stomachs. <laughs> Lord, thank you for an opportunity to just have a family conversation today. I pray that you would be honored and glorified in the answers and in the questions. Holy Spirit, would you come and be our teacher today and our encourager and our comforter and our motivator. We're so honored to be able to acknowledge your presence already here today. So Lord, go before us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, Jared, here we go. All righty. And uh, just so everybody knows, the questions that are sent to the CTK number, those are always anonymous. So we're never going to give your name. Your privacy is uh, important to us. Uh, but yeah, let's, let's dive in. All right. Let's see what questions we got. Ooh, this is a good one. Uh, so this is a CTK question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I love tattoo questions. So this says... <laughs> Are tattoos a sin? In the Bible, a verse states to not mark or tattoo ourselves for the dead. So if we aren't tattooing for the dead, is that okay? Uh, I don't have an issue with tattoos. So <laughs> I mean, for me, I, I don't. Is there a biblical verse regarding that? I don't have any, um, but that's just because I wouldn't even know what to do it and I don't want the pain of it to be quite honest <laughs> so, that's honest that's so open I don't know like I think be really cautious what you are putting on your body because it's permanent and I think people make really yeah. dumb decisions in the heat of the moment so realize this is this is a permanent mark on you so I I've seen tattoos used as like people ask what does that to tattoo mean and, it, and it's something really relevant of how God's been you know, yeah. moving in your life. So I think it can be an amazing evangelistic tool. Yeah. God can use that for his glory too. So I don't have an issue with tattoos, but that's not a pastoral answer. Yeah, but it's a good answer. <laughs> I, I don't have a problem with tattoos e either. And what people do is they take out this one little verse from Leviticus that says you're not supposed to mark your body. And the people of Israel were commanded that because pagan nations did that and God wanted them to be set apart. So I actually have a pastor friend who has that Leviticus verse tattooed on his forearm <laughs> and people will go what's that verse he goes it's the verse that says you're not supposed to get a tattoo in the old testament but i live in the new testament i'm under grace so i can put whatever i want to wherever i want to kind of an interesting point so i think the caution is exactly what laurel said it's just like it's permanent um gravity's a thing over time just saying um probably shouldn't say that but i said it anyway so 
So be careful with those kinds of things. But remember that it actually, everything is supposed to be a testimony. So we have staff members here who have tattoos and often I'll ask them, what's the story behind it? And it can be a very beautiful thing. Sometimes it's in memory of a loved one. Sometimes it's a verse of scripture that actually calls them to a place. It reminds them of something that God has called and created them to do and to be. And so I don't have a problem with it all. We are under grace, which means there is no law prohibiting that, that says, um, and that was a part of what was known as the moral law, specifically for the people of Israel. And so because we're under grace, it's not an issue. Just use wisdom and, and common sense. Yeah, oh, that's great. All right, let's see what our next question is. Alrighty, so this is another uh, Christ the King question. This says, I've lost touch with God. I have more questions than ever. My most important question all point to just have faith. How can I build faith when my questions remain unanswered? Uh, oh, that's good. I love that question, and I think there's so many questions on faith, and we talk about that a lot even in the podcast, right? Um, and, and the measure of faith and, and all of that. And I think there's way, way too much pressure on, on what your measure of faith is. And the truth, what matters more is that we know God's faithfulness. And mm, he always is with us, whether we think our questions are being answered or not, they are. He hears every prayer. He tells us, come to me, ask me. So those questions, we're supposed to bring them to him. And he promises to answer them. So... Yeah, I think just, he, he'll remind you too. I think sometimes we forget how faithful he is when we're going through another tough time. And we were reading about David, and I love this so much, where he's hiding from Saul and he's inquiring of the Lord because he's terrified, right? All this army is after him. And, mm. and he goes to a priest to inquire of the Lord. And, and I, it doesn't say what that conversation, you know, what it was all about, but the priest hands him Goliath's sword. So the one that, as a kid, he took down Goliath with, it was the, the stones for sure, but mm -hmm. he kind of finished him off with the sword. Uh, just saying. That's true. Yeah, <laughs> so, that's true. And there's no talk of what happened with that sword, you know, in between that time. But here, as an adult man, God is saying again, we took down giants before, and we're gonna take them down again. And he hands him that sword, as a reminder of his faithfulness. So I would just say, don't be scared of the questions and, and it's okay if you feel like they're not being answered. They are being answered. Mm -hmm. Just look for him, you know, with, not in your own perspective, but in his, and it's reading the word too. That is a huge one yeah. for us because sometimes we try and just see it in our everyday moments. And my biggest questions, I go back to the Bible because I always say, if you don't hear what God is saying, go back to what he's said. Absolutely, which is such a good thing. Laurel's always reminding me too about the perspective of faith. It's, it talks about a mustard seed, right? Yeah. A mustard seed is tiny. It, it, it's absolutely minute, but it grows over time. And so I think the question really comes back to how do you build that faith? You allow it to grow in your heart over time by the word, by reminding yourself, by asking good questions. Um, Laurel actually challenged me one time to go and just look at the number of times it's in scripture they inquired of the Lord. I think we, we've lost uh, the art of asking God questions and, and coming with expectation that he actually has answers for us. And so you build that by asking questions, being obedient, listening to what it is that he's saying and allowing those things to grow. I think another way to to grow your faith is to be around people that are also growing their faith. That's why biblical community is so important. That's why spending time together with other believers is actually important because sometimes, let's face it, I don't have a lot of faith, but I can borrow some from someone who, who has actually has the gift of faith. It's one of Laurel's spiritual gifts. And so I will often be inspired by the level of faith with which she approaches a situation. And so together, we're able to continue to grow as we call each other to places that are higher. So I, I think a part of it too is, you know, it says my most important questions all point to just have faith. That actually is important. But faith is active. Faith is a step. Faith is when you're moving. So I think some people, it's just, you know, they sit there and try to, to flex their faith, but they're not doing anything. And I think it's so important for us to be active in actually taking that step of faith, whether it's going out and doing something to serve somebody, to love somebody actively, to, to take a faith risk 
and to see how God meets you in those moments. That's all a part of building faith. It's like building a muscle. You got to tear it down, you build it back up again, and it gets stronger every time. But it, it's not something you attain. Like just having a personal relationship mm-hmm. with Jesus requires faith. So we have faith just in that decision. And he says it just takes the faith the size of a mustard seed to move mountains. So even with that level of faith, we have all it takes to make a huge difference in this world. So it's not something we have to work to attain. Absolutely. We just have to be obedient. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, and I think a lot of those unanswered prayers, sometimes we think they're unanswered, but really it's on a different timeline. Yeah. Because yep. we're going to have our five-year plan, our 10-year plan, but really those five or 10 years is going off God's timeline yeah. and not ours. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Fantastic. All right. Let's see what we got next. Uh, this is another Christ the King question. It says, as a child and teen, did Jesus know that he was the son of God or did he only learn his true identity as he got older? Well, that's really, really interesting. Um, so immediately my mind goes to that story in scripture where Jesus is 12 years old. It actually identifies his age and his parents lose track of him, which not sure what that says about Joseph and Mary, but that, that, there was a cultural piece, right? They actually traveled together in community. So it wasn't uncommon. And we've experienced this when we go to Israel. Everybody looks after everybody else's children. You see kids out at we different- We should adopt that here. <laughs> we should adopt that here. Yeah. <laughs> but, but they literally would look after each other's kids. And so it wasn't uncommon for Joseph and Mary to think that, oh, my brother or my sister, they're gonna, the aunts and the uncles, the cousins are gonna be looking after Jesus. When they do track him down, he's actually back in the temple and he's teaching the religious leaders of the day. And they challenge him. They actually like, what were you doing? What were you thinking? And Jesus said, I'm supposed to be about my father's business. So even as a 12 year old, he had a deep understanding of the role he was going to play over time. So I believe that, that Jesus as God and as fully man, fully human and fully child, had a deep comprehension of all of the things that God was calling him to because he knew what his father's business was going to be. And uh, uh, that would be mine. Do you have a different perspective? No, Same? agreed. Love That's it. it. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's see what we got next. Uh, oh, I like this question. It says, other than praying, is there anything I can do to figure out if the dreams I'm having are signs of God's will for me? And this is from Emmeline in California. Yeah, okay. If the dreams, I mean, I think God always challenges me to write it down. There is accountability in in writing things down and going back and revisiting. Mm -hmm. And um, often he will send people with another word, you know, that that confirms it too. But I think if you have a dream before I would act on it or run with it, I would write it down and really ponder it for sure, pray and and ask God for for signs of confirmation. Dreams are hard because he definitely says he speaks to you in dreams, but I think we have to be pretty cautious too that sometimes it's, you know, maybe a bad burger <laughs> and, yeah. and it can kind of lead us. It's true. <laughs> so I think we do have to be really careful that, that we, we really weigh what is God saying to us and look for that confirmation, especially if, it, if it's, you know, a big decision that could be a result of it. Yeah, exactly. I would also say it's important for us to have people that we can literally lay things in front of. Yeah. So I will, I, if I have a, a dream or a vision, I'll often come to Laurel and say, would you pray through this with me? Can we actually talk about this together? And of course, if it doesn't line up with the word, it's not from God. So if you are seeing something that's counter to the word of God, it's off the table, it doesn't count. Uh, God also talks about being in submission to authorities. And so sometimes if you don't have someone, you could come to someone at the church, a pastor, um, one of, one of uh, our church council and say, I just want to submit this to you. Can you give me wisdom or perspective? I think it's also really, really important that the fact that God says that the things he gives us brings about joy and peace mm-hmm. and hope. Um, and, and, and when it's simply bringing angst or anxiety, We know that that, even a word of correction from God will not bring about anxiety. It will bring about resolve to actually want to step in the right direction. So, But he does bring warning. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. so he will bring warning, but that warning won't necessarily create fear. I think that's, I think, appreciate that because that's a better word for it. It's not going to prompt fear inside of you. You might be concerned because that warning is dire and it may be for you specifically or for a group of people. 
But I think when we submit those things to God, when we submit them to each other, and then when we hold them with the fact that this is God's gift to me, I think that changes the way we often perceive those, those things. Um, and God will confirm his word to you. Mm -hmm. that's a promise God says I will confirm my word for you if you don't have confirmation keep praying keep talking keep submitting and while you're in that process over a long period of time expect God to actually confirm that because he said this is my will concerning you and so it's important for us to be able to align those things together yeah well, that's wonderful Alrighty, this is a Christ the King question. This one says, how do I handle losing the father of my children in the midst of finding God in my faith? Oh, wow. Well, that's heavy. And first of all, uh, I think we're sorry. We're sorry that you lost um, your husband and the father of your children. The Bible says when one of us hurts, we're all supposed to hurt. When one of us grieves, we're all supposed to grieve. So I want you to know if you're here, um, we really care about you. We want to make sure that you know uh, that there is love from your church family and from God in the midst of this. I think reconciling grief is a difficult thing. And we've been walking through this together in the last little while. Laurel, uh, Laurel's mom passed away just a little while ago, and uh, we're still feeling that. We're still feeling the weight of that. And yet, I, what I would say is, I mean, that beautiful promise of Scripture that says God is near to the brokenhearted. Mm -hmm. To know that even as you're grieving, that Jesus was a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. That's how Scripture describes him. And that it is possible to lose someone you love and find someone who loves you at the same time. And so I really want to encourage you to hold on to the God who understands sorrow and grief and, and move towards him. Don't turn away in the midst of your grief, but to actually to discover that. Yeah, well, and I'm not surprised at one of the darkest times in your life is when you experience mm. the beauty of who God is and all his promises. So uh, Rick and Ann Campbell were praying with us just before the service, and I think the verse was in Isaiah 63, it was, 9, yeah. um, but I loved it because it was talking about how when we're distressed, he distresses with us and he sends mm -hmm. um, a, a, the, pre yeah, the presence of an, of an angel, of, you know, his presence in, yeah. with an angel that, and it says in his, his love and his kindness and his mercy, he carries us until the days of old. So. I just love that promise that when we're hurting, he's hurting with us. So it's no surprise you're feeling him close and he's near. But the most beautiful part of that verse is it says he lifts us up and will literally carry us through. So I would just, yeah, encourage you, be so thankful he feels close. And mm -hmm. I think it's hard sometimes to reconcile sorrow and hope at the same time. And I've had to do that on my journey with blindness is really grieve the loss and and the sorrow and i have really really dark days but i also have to be really very real that i can have all the hope and belief in a miracle and still be sad and hurting i mm -hmm. i don't have to choose one or the other you can both of those live in the same place they did on the cross right there's never been more sorrow and more hope in one place than than on the cross so I think it's okay to feel all that you're feeling right now, the hurt, the pain, and also the hope. It's, it's actually a beautiful gift. Yeah. I, I want to go back to, to talk about something, how, how those things worked out. So we were, so just a little bit ago, Laurel had actually talked about how God had given her a picture that we weren't going to be on the stage alone. Like Psalm 91 says, he will command his angels concerning you. And so she had this picture of two angels standing with us on the stage. It was beautiful. Well, then we get to the prayer room and Anne talks about these two angels that God has given a company. So there's that confirmation, right? We're praying together. We're confirming together. Well, and it was specific. I said Very last specific. night, like God showed me a picture of two angels on stage with us. So maybe you can see them. We can. <laughs> <But>, oh, <Hello>, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're here. Um, but so Anne said this morning, she goes, there will be two angels on stage with you today. And it was, it was this beautiful confirmation beautiful of that. Gift. So yeah. yeah, there's so much power in knowing his presence is truly, truly here. Yeah. yeah. So what, whatever you're walking through in the loss, 
that's where God shows up in such powerful ways. When we have lost so much of ourselves, or we feel like we've lost that, that's when God shows up so strong and so powerful. He's there all of the time, but to claim that and to live inside of that, I, I also love the fact that um, God describes himself as the father to the fatherless, which means to our sister who wrote this, you may have lost your husband, but there is a father in heaven who will be with you and will walk with you as you nurture your children and grow. You are not alone. He is with you and we are with you. And we want you to know that. Yeah, I want you to know that. Yeah, amen. Very true. Uh, so this is actually a question for Laurel. Uh, the question says, what can you actually see and how can we pray for you? Mm, I love you know, that. This is such a hard question to to explain, because I think people are confused sometimes because I talk about being blind and then they see me on my phone and they're like, what? How can you use your phone? <laughs> yeah. um, but I've got this little speck of central vision in my, my left eye. And even though it's blurry, um, it allows me to see things that are small. So, you know, contrary to normal thinking that you would do something really, really big and it would help me see it better, it doesn't. It just means I see a smaller portion of that image. So on my phone with the right contrast and um, the right size of font, I can actually slowly read things. It's difficult, but I don't see faces. So when I walk right by you, please don't be offended because I, I, so, I so want you to come up and say, this is who I am. I, you know, I, I want to know who's around me and I want to talk to you. I just honestly can't see you. Um, We've been asked before, well, when Laurel talks to me, she can actually look straight into my eyes. So I'm not looking at your eyes. I do hear your voice, and so I can look in that direction, and I can kind of see shadows. But um, So I try and orient myself where I'm, you know, where your eyes are. And sometimes if you see me looking away, I have some vision in the peripheral, so I'll try and align myself and then look back at you. Because I feel weird if I'm talking to your chest or your ear, you know, it's, it's awkward. <laughs> so I'm, I'm trying really hard to look in your eyes, but, but I, can't, I, I can't see if you're crying. I can't see if you're smiling. Um, I certainly can't see who you are. I can't even see your wrinkles. So, you know, for me to say you look beautiful, it's kind of like, <laughs> I mean, I truly believe you do, but probably people don't put a lot of weight in those <laughs> words. Uh, how can you pray for me? Uh, this journey is 32 years long yes, and yeah. so I think it's just perseverance in in just keeping the faith and I really do exactly like even with Goliath's sword exactly mm -hmm. when when I feel like oh Lord where are you have you forgotten he reminds me again and again and again I have always been faithful and I will continue to be faithful and as Jared said his timing matters it's perfect it's absolutely perfect and I have to trust in that timing so um yeah, I think just, just that God uses my story, that's the cry of my heart more than anything, is I want people to see Jesus in the story because the Jesus I've got to know on this journey, wow, he's amazing. And I want people to know that Jesus. Yeah. Um, I think my wife is extraordinary with the way she handles a disability that is often misunderstood. Um, the fact that she can't see my wrinkles is awesome. Um, <laughs> but at the same time, the level of faith with which she operates is a pretty incredible thing. It's inspiring for me, and I get to see it every day. Um, walking together has been an incredible honor. When people stop us, like if we're out for dinner somewhere, and people come up and say, hey, Laurel, we want you to know we're praying for your miracle after 30 some years, like that is so humbling and so beautiful. Um, but I just wanna say the way in which Laurel carries, this has been such an incredible inspiration for me. I know it's been an inspiration for you as a church because some of you have been with us for like 25 plus years of walking this journey together. And I'm gonna say it again, we are still praying for a miracle. We're still believing for a miracle. The day it happens, you will know it because I will be up on the top of the building screaming from the top of my lungs. And while you're praying for our miracle, know that we're praying for yours yeah, as well. So true. Um, it's not always easy. The days aren't always easy and simple. Yeah. 
Sometimes they can be really difficult, but we still live life to the fullest. On Thursday night, we went axe throwing with Brian and Kristen <laughs> Barron. Um, the blind lady had an axe, and she's throwing it at a wall, and she kept telling me to get back behind the cage, and I was trying to be helpful in an incredibly awkward way, but we just, we continue to live life together because Laurel is full of both joy and adventure. And I wouldn't want to share the journey with anybody else. And thank you for sharing it with us as well. Yeah, we appreciate thank it. You. Thanks for that question. That yeah. Really uh, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Alrighty. This question says, what is my biblical responsibility as a wife to continue a marriage with a man who is an alcoholic and mentally abusive? So on the live, we actually get this question quite a bit. Yeah. And I think it's important for us to understand that, that God doesn't expect us to simply stay in an abusive relationship, suck it up and keep going. That's not what God would have. He wants you to be protected. He wants you to be safe. He also wants your husband to come to him to surrender his alcoholism and his need for that so that he can be the husband that God wants him to be. And so there are biblical grounds for divorce. And I've preached on this before here. I think the thing that we have to keep remember is God grants us a regrettable permission. The Bible says that God hates divorce. He doesn't hate divorced people. He loves divorced people. He hates divorce because of what it does to people. It, it's heartbreaking. It crushes. It tears families apart. It tears people apart. So God doesn't hate divorced people. He loves them doesn't like the effect of it, and he actually does give a regrettable permission. So in an area, so adultery is an area where you have that. Now, here's the other thing that I need to remind you. We have people in this room right now who are married to each other. Adultery happened in their relationship, and they found a way to work through it to restore the relationship, and they're still together. So just because there is a permission granted doesn't mean you necessarily need to take it, because God is a God of grace. He can put things back together again. Abuse, adultery, and abandonment. Jesus speaks directly to and says those are biblical grounds for divorce. And so your biblical responsibility is to leave room for God to work, but you need to be safe. And that means if you need to step away for safety's sake, you need to do that. And we will support you and walk along with you the best we can as a church to make sure that you are safe. And then we begin the work of trying to put the pieces back together and only Jesus can put those pieces back together. That's why we talk about Jesus in all things. So you have a biblical responsibility to look after yourself, care for your soul, take the steps that are needed, seek wisdom and counsel to find out whether you have biblical grounds for divorce and whether you should actually take that. Um, and then you need to pray that God will invade the heart of your husband and allow him to see that alcohol is an idol and he doesn't need to serve that idol. That he can be a sober-minded, godly man who will treat you as you deserve, which is with love, respect, and honor. Yeah, I, I mean, I think, you know, when you get married, you make that vow in sickness and in health, right? And alcoholism is definitely a sickness. So, yeah. um, just like you said, there, there's definitely a lot of steps you go Many through be before, before divorce. I think what crosses the line is the abuse because we also have to know our worth and, and who God says we are and um, that is just not a healthy place to be. So there are lines in there, but, but marriage is hard and mm -hmm. um, there are so many challenges throughout your marriage, including addictions and... and um, it's so hard when you see your husband turn into somebody that wasn't the person that you made those vows to. But I think that's the whole point. We're yeah, standing at the altar saying, we don't know what the future holds, but I commit to standing with you. So I think that's a really tough question because there's so many nuances there's a to lot it. Of layers. Yeah, but the abuse, the abuse is definitely a line that you draw in the sand. I think as soon as it crosses into abuse, you do have to protect yourself yeah well part of that too is so we, when we make a vow we make a covenant when the person has been abusive they broke the covenant and so now you have to make some really heavy hard decisions and I would encourage you don't make the decision alone 
Walk with it with other godly people who can give you perspective and not just tell you what you want to hear, but what Jesus wants you to hear. I think those things, I love the fact that you said that it is. It's, pro, it's a process. There's layers. We have to do it. There's many, many steps before we get to that ultimate decision of we're going to dissolve this union. And I think seeking godly counsel and wisdom is big. Professional therapy, Laurel and I are huge fans of professional therapy. Um, just uh, last week, a week and a half ago, we met with our therapist. We were on Zoom and uh, Dr. Patty Ducklau, we call him Ducky. Ducky was there and he was helping us walk through and process through. Everybody, I believe, can benefit from somebody who can get inside of your emotions and your thinking and your heart and help you see the way of Jesus in that, to see the way of God through that. Even though we had like massive fight after, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we did. <laughs> Probably should have called him back right away. Exactly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's great. Thank he, you, too. He helped us have some heated fellowship. Yeah, that's what we call it. Yep. Yeah, heated fellowship. Yeah. 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 Thank you. It's such a very uh, real question. I love that. All right. This next question says, what does it mean to seek God's face, and how do I do that? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, I think it's going to be different for, for everyone. Um, for some people, it's, you know, climbing a mountaintop. Katie Steele, who so many of you know, that for her, it's like climb a mountain, and that's, that's where mm -hmm. she feels the closest connection to Jesus. And um, for some, it's music. It's just listening to music will take you to a place in your heart and, you know, in a space in your, where you're, you just can, you can see him, you can feel him in a way. Um, I think the biggest thing is just try and find a place where there's not distractions where you just feel like he is your sole focus. So for me, it's a house in, or a, a room in our house where I do, we call it the Jesus room and that's where mm -hmm. I go and it's just me and my Bible and um, yeah, it's just a quiet place. I make sure all the, the boxes are checked on my list so I, uh, my brain isn't running this way and that. So I truly think whatever you can do that has, that just wipes distraction, out of your life, that's the best place to truly focus on, on Jesus. Yeah, absolutely. I love the pictures that scripture gives us when it comes to how everyone did it different. David would go to En Gedi, which if you've traveled with us to Israel, um, some trips have been able to go there. This is beautiful waterfall. And he would go there to reflect and worship and think. For other people, it's doing something with their hands. It's creating, it's artistic. Uh, and, and you can literally find God through their art. And we're blessed here at the church. We have a bunch of artists and they do that and they, they talk about how they connect with God during that. I think you were seeking God's face earlier when, when Ben and Michelle and Olga and Wyatt and Randy were leading you in worship and you were seeking the face of God and saying, God, I want to know you. Like the atmosphere is changing now. Why? Is it because we're doing something? No, it's because the spirit of the Lord is here. For me, seeking God's face has become more and more personal as I've gotten older. Um, we were talking about this the other day that my relationship with God used to have this level of formality to it all the time. It felt a little stiff, to be honest. And now I've been so inspired by the way Laurel asks questions that I'm trying to be more disciplined. I come to God with a question and say, I'm just gonna sit here and rest in your presence until I feel like you've either stirred an answer or told me that I need to go on in my day because the answer is gonna show up as I literally walk through the path that God has for me. And so I'm trying to make it more personal, to make it more experiential. Some people are journalists, journalers, they love to, to write out. Mm -hmm. um, well, and I think just, just be cautious of what that means too. Like in, I think people sometimes picture, you know, the, this light coming down from heaven. <laughs> and it's this beautiful moment. And truthfully, it can be really raw and really real and you might yeah. be really angry and that was the biggest thing I think I encouraged you is you felt like you couldn't bring your real emotions you to him. Permission. You had yeah. to be all clean and tidy before he went there and I said like you bring for us he sees the ugliest side of me because this is my safest place. I know he's not going to get up and leave the room. Well, not usually. <laughs> Maybe <you're up>. Sometimes. <laughs> yeah. But for the most part, he's with me, right? And, and there is no safer place than Jesus. And so we have to feel like we can lay it all down. Our, our fears, our anger, our frustrations, he can handle it all. So as long as 
you know, that seeing the face of Jesus, we don't always picture this beautiful, serene moment because sometimes the most beautiful face we see is him smiling at us when we're giving him our ugliest part of who we are. Yeah. And, and, and his loving kindness in that moment. Exactly. And, and to, to think about that, like, so you're frustrated. God knows everything, but you don't want to trust him with your frustration. It just makes no sense, right? It's like he already knows you're frustrated, but you're pretending that you're not. So it's duplicitous. Instead of going, God, I'm frustrated. Like, I want an answer to this problem. I don't know how to solve this. And it feels like you're being quiet. C could, you, could you show something to me? There's something very raw and real about that. And I believe that God's heart is so tender to his children. Like when we come frustrated, it's not like, come on, get your act together. Go do something. Like that's not the response of God. It's like, thank you for trusting it to me. I already knew you were frustrated. I get that. Let's walk this through together. I'll literally, I will take you by the hand and we can walk through this desert of frustration together and I will not leave you. I will not forsake you. You can trust me because I don't believe God wants us to be frustrated all the time. There's times when it's good to be frustrated because we need to work some stuff out. But to take a step in that direction, that's the tenderness. That's the father heart of God for each of us today. Yeah, yeah that's beautiful. All right, I think we have time for maybe one more question. Uh, yeah, final question. So this one says, how do you forgive someone for something they've done to someone you love? Uh, that's, a, that's tough because that's when the fierce comes out, right? Yeah. yeah. So l let me talk about this mama bear here for just a second. I mean, <laughs> y y you can hurt her, which would not be a good thing. Not a good thing. Oh, okay. <laughs> we'll unpack that later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's not the way I meant it. I'm trying to think of how I can rephrase this. Let me just reel that one back in. But um, if Laurel gets hurt, she handles it in a certain way. If you hurt one of her children, oh boy, watch out. Because the mama bear will come out of the cave and she will... She, she will defend her cubs. That's just the way that it is. And all the other mama bears in the room are nodding their heads right now. I see them all over the place. So I think it is very difficult to forgive. I think it's easier to forgive someone who may have hurt you, to forgive someone who's hurt someone that you love. That's a really big challenge, but it doesn't exempt us because God told us to forgive. We're supposed to be people of forgiveness. And so, and it's not, if you were here for Ryan or... or um, I can't remember who spoke about the 70 times seven. It's not the 490, it's not the clicker, but it's actually, no, we're gonna find a place of forgiveness in our heart. But I think we have to work really, really hard, which when you think about it, God the Father forgave us for what we did to his son. That's the kind of forgiveness that God is calling us into. Yeah, it, just to clarify too, I, I think you're talking mama bear when your kids are young and you feel really protective. Yeah, As adult I children, I, I mean, they can stand on their own two feet, so I'm yeah. not running to their defenses. Um, just need to clarify that. That's good, clarify good clarity. That. I think, um, yeah, when it comes to, to forgiving those that we love too, I think so often we can take everything as a personal offense or even a personal attack when really so much of the hurt and wounding that happens to us is coming from another person's wounds and hurts. And I think it's really, it's really important that in some of those moments, we actually try and see the full picture and the full story because often words are said, things are done that feel so personal and so hurtful. And really there's a lot more history to them. And it's not dismissing that. It doesn't mean we can be reckless with our words or, or actions for sure. But I think we do have to be careful realizing just as sometimes we'll say things we don't really mean, mm -hmm. so do other people. And forgiveness is, is hard, especially when it's, it's done to somebody that we love. And it's, it's, sometimes it's just so unjust and so, so wrong. But like you said, we do, have to, we do have to forgive. It doesn't do us any good not to forgive. It, it won't change the situation. It doesn't punish them anymore. Um, it doesn't make anything right out of what happened, yeah, the injustice. Right. It really just ends up hurting us more. So uh, 
we have to choose to forgive. Obviously, it's pretty much impossible to forget, so that's a, that's a whole other story, and we do have to walk through, through what that looks like. And sometimes, you know, the not forgetting part and the forgiveness part, it doesn't mean it just opens a door again to friendship or whatever, you know, the situation was. We do have to set up healthy boundaries, too. But, yeah, yeah. forgiveness isn't an option. Yeah, it is. Scripture's plain, right? Forgive as the Lord forgave you. It may take time, and you may have to do it repeatedly in order to come to a place of forgiveness, but forgive as the Lord forgave you is what God calls all of his children to. That's the standard. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So we're getting ready to wrap up. In fact, we went over a little bit over time and get caught up in the things. And uh, just, so for, just so we're clear, I did not give permission for anyone to hurt my wife. Just, just reel that, back one in, that one back in again. Um, <laughs> But thank you for taking the time. I want to encourage you after the service today. Maybe something we talked about struck a chord. And every week, these people come and stand up here at the front called the After Service Prayer Team. They're a ministry team of Christ the King. They'd love to pray with you. If you'd like to give us a, a prayer request, you can go to prayer.ctk.church. We'd love to be able to uh, walk alongside of you as you're walking through this. Thank you for your honest questions. Thank you for allowing us the privilege. We don't have the answers. God has all the answers. And so we love knowing the fact that, that any gaps that we may have left, and I'm sure there were lots of them, but Jesus and the Holy Spirit can fill those gaps in for you. If we didn't get to your question, I want to say this as well. If we didn't get to your question, it's not because it didn't matter. It's just because we get a lot of questions that come in, and uh, they try to sort them as quickly as they can and look for, for uh, you know, questions that would, that would affect as many people as possible. So if you have a question, it wasn't answered, you can join Jared and I live four o'clock Pacific Standard Time on Wednesdays and the second Wednesday of every month, Laurel is there. We would love to have you come and drop in on the chat. So you go to jesus.net slash live and we're there live every Wednesday at four and it's an amazing opportunity to hear questions from around the world, which is pretty amazing as well. So thank you for coming. God bless you. You are dismissed. And if you need prayer, we'll be up here at the front. Can we say thank you to Laurel and to Jared for coming and hanging out with us today? Awesome. Bless you guys. <laughs>